This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's family day and the Flames have finally snapped their losing streak as we're midway through the Coyotes game, but... Matt, we'll talk about that one later. This team won a game again, and uh, some people, it seemed like in the Sea of Red, didn't think that would ever happen based on some of the fan reaction. Yeah, well, uh, when they were playing as poorly as they did, it it makes sense that some people would be a little trepidatious about the their game, especially because they were doing so well, then they hit the break, and then the wheels fell off the wagon. Well, let's talk about these games. We'll go to the first one of the week. Uh, last Tuesday on the 12th, the Calgary Flames were in Tampa Bay to take on the Tampa Bay Lightning, the best team in the league. And I think a lot of us made more of a deal about this game than we should have because it was against the best team. But it's a Western Conference opponent, or sorry, it's an Eastern Conference opponent, not a Western Conference opponent. And if we keep that in mind, I'm not too concerned that the Flames lost 6-3 with Monaghan scoring twice. The bad news is uh, the loss was the fourth time in fifth game in five games for the Flames. So overall thoughts on this game? Well, frankly, the team just simply looked outclassed. And when it comes to like the playoffs, you're not wanting to... like If the things go as they likely will... Tampa Bay would be the Stanley Cup finalist from the East, like, unless weird stuff happens. So, like, the fact that they look so poor against them does not bode well. No, but last time we played them, it was 5-4 shootout win for Tampa, so we fared better in that one. True. It's just they have to play better, and, you know, it's disconcerting because of the fact that, like, they did get completely outclassed by the opposition, but... Every team has bad games. Like I said, I'd rather, I guess, it against Tampa Bay, who's an Eastern Conference opponent, than against a Western Conference opponent. Oh, for sure. For sure. And that that is one of the saving graces. It's just that, like, this was a measuring stick game, and they definitely went flying under the bar. And then the next game, the Calgary Flames went to Sunrise, Florida, to take on your second favorite NHL team, the Florida Panthers. Um... Reimer and the Panthers won in the shootout, and they handed the Flames their fourth straight loss. All wasn't lost here. The Calgary Flames ended up getting one point out of this one. So, you know, they they didn't go away with nothing. But I thought in this one the Flames played pretty well. Um, they, They didn't play maybe as good as we've seen them, a lot better than the Tampa game. But I think this is one of those times where you worked hard and things just didn't go your way. Yeah, and this was one of those games where... If the first line had anything going, they win that game handily. It's just that, like, Florida sucks, to to be perfectly frank. And they should have easily won that game. But with the first line not clicking, it makes it a lot more difficult to win games. And the depth guys played well. Like, when they put up that many shots, like, you're expecting them to win. But... They just they didn't really seem to get a ton of high end chances against Reimer and to his credit he played well and they got a point and the Flames do need to f- figure out something in the shootout because other than Monahan like everybody's kind of trash in the shootout I think they're 0 for 13 this year so and that's the whole rest of the team so it's they need to figure some buddy else to score and i i don't mind them trying eat bread in that game just because of the fact that you gotta try something to maybe spark a goal here and there yeah and manjipani's looking hot lately yeah and frankly like i wouldn't even be adverse of trying shillington or anderson in the shootout even though that sounds a little weird they are fairly skilled stick handlers so they might have some moves what about shooting the captain well, nobody wants to shoot the captain. What are you talking about? No. <laughs> uh, I'm not too sure on him. 
uh, I think he's not as creative. It, I wouldn't be adverse to it. It's just I'd try the kids first because the kids have kind of grown up with playing the shootout where uh, Giordano, like that, came in when he came in the league. So it's he's not as used to it as the other guys are there's a song for any musicians in the sea of red you can take the old song i shot the sheriff and spoof it i shot the captain yeah um i wasn't surprised while we're on this florida game to see mike smith in net. i think it was the right game to put him in for i don't think we all expect him to play as well as he did but even when you and i talked last week we we're saying yeah that's probably about when you give smitty another shot yeah well that was uh like on calgary puck i had mentioned that uh, like the the Flames need Smith to play or a goalie, whether it's him or somebody else, to play good for a short stretch, just to allow Riddick to have time to practice and work on some things. And with Smith playing well, he earned himself another start in Pittsburgh, and he played well, and he earned another start today. And it, frankly, I'd just keep running him. Not so much for Smith playing well, which that's an added bonus, but to allow Riddick some time to work on the little things that uh, he's gotten away from and let him reset so that way he can be good moving into March and into the postseason. Let's talk about that Pittsburgh game. This is one, I think, again, an Eastern Conference opponent, not a huge game in terms of standings for the Flames, but I think we all want revenge from the 9-1 butt whooping this team took earlier in the season from the Penguins. And yeah. going into the game looking a little bit different for Calgary. James Neal was out in this one. He had got injured in the Florida game. Calgary called up Curtis Lazar before this game, the guy who's been saying lately he's ready to play in the NHL. The Flames brought him up and didn't get him the chance to play in the NHL yet. He was a healthy scratch. Um, and also, the second start in the row in a row for, in this one for Mike Smith. And the Calgary Flames snapped that losing streak 5-4 against the Penguins. And I think in this one, as much as you know, I've said a few times on the show, when you get four scored on you, you probably deserve to lose. If you look at the scores for the Penguins in this one, it's hard not to get you know three or four goals against you. Well, and the thing is, is that all four of the goals were either the cause of a weak penalty call towards us or a complete non-call on one of the Penguins. And the refing was kind of horrible in that game, and it made the game a lot closer than it should have been. And it is what it is, but Mike Smith, he was fantastic in the game. He, he gave up four goals, but if it wasn't for him being on his game, it could have easily been eight or nine and he kept the team in it, and the Flames got the two points, and that's the important thing. Yeah, in the end, it doesn't matter how you get them, you get the two points. And uh, a few interesting notes on this one. Andrew Maggiapani got his second goal, and Austin Zarnik, who sat out for almost a month, got his third goal of the season in this one. So some some depth scoring coming out here, uh, which is nice to see. And Derek Ryan had a three-point game, which was nice to see, and he's been very good of late, and he even scored in the Arizona game early. And it's just nice to see that we can score five goals and not have one of them come from the first line. Yeah, goals from Mangiapane, Zarnik, ha uh, Hamannick, Bennett, and Froelich in this one. So, yeah, not that first line. And you know what? Every line's going to slump, but that's what you need. When your first line's slumping, somebody needs to pick up the slack. Definitely. And that's one of the reasons that separates a team like Calgary from a team like Edmonton is that our first line's good, just like theirs is, but we have guys that can back them up. Yeah. You know, Matt, I was thinking this week, I had a rough day at work one day this week, and I was thinking to myself, as bad as today was, I could be the coach of the Edmonton Oilers, and I thought my day at work wasn't so bad after all. Exactly. Did you hear about Hitchcock getting lectured by the management for being too hard on the players? No. He literally did. It's like, um, that's why you brought Hitchcock in. Like, uh, they're, they're getting angry at Keenan or Tortorella for being too angry at the players. Yeah. Well, you look at Edmonton, like, they just waved uh, Brandon Manning today. Like, they could have got a, a third or a fourth round pick for Kajula at the deadline if they really wanted to. But now they gave him up, 
he's playing well with Chicago, and they're saying, here, take whatever that guy is for free. You know, like, it just... Yeah. And then Sam Gagne is back, so, yeah. It's Edmonton. Well, let's get back to Calgary here. There's uh, We can crap on Edmonton maybe a little bit after the deadline once we see them play their whole hand, but... Uh, currently, the Calgary Flames are playing the. There's Air- always time to crap on the Oilers. Come on, it's part of what makes us Flames fans. Yeah, I just <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of feeling bad for them right now. I never feel bad for the Oilers. They've got Baby Gretzky trying to clean up Torelli's mess, and I yeah. I don't think this mess can be cleaned up. No, frankly, like being optimistic, it'd take about four years maybe five to properly fix what they've got wrong and that's if you have somebody competent in charge and yeah i just think right now it's gonna be tough to hire a gm i think they're gonna i think hitch isn't gonna want to come back next year it's gonna be tough to hire a coach like you know if you're a free agent you wonder is it better to go with edmonton or wait and see if you might get a call from seattle i don't know who edmonton's gonna get well frankly i wouldn't I don't think any player in their right mind would willingly want to go to Edmonton. That's at this why point. they're going to have to trade their way into success. Yeah. Or do what they should do, which is just embrace the suck and, you know, just eat it for like three, four years. Well, they've and done that. And try that's to still going to make them better. It. Well, if they were competent, they could draft outside of the first round and get multiple players that are good, but, you know. It is Edmonton, so... You send in your resume, Matt. Honestly, I don't even think I could fix them. (laughs) Well, you can't do any worse than what's there. Oh, hell. You could pick any random hockey fan, and they couldn't do worse than what they're they're doing up there. There's the new promotion, the Edmonton GM of the Day promotion. Yeah. One lucky fan will have their seat number called, and you're the general manager for the day. You can't screw it up any worse than we already have, so have fun. (laughs) On on days we don't have games, the team will be run by an Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> Magically, the Oilers get better. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the Xbox said they'd accept uh, Connor McDavid for somebody's whole team. How come it's not working in real life? Let's fire the Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> You're being too hard on the players. <laughs> Damn you, the Xbox. Xbox. <laughs> the Xbox said the Talbot would sign for eight hundred thousand. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, let's get back to Calgary here. Some more good news on our side of Alberta. Uh, five minutes, 20 seconds left in the third period as Calgary plays Arizona in their family day matinee, and the Flames are up 4-2. to two. What do you think of what you've seen so far in this game, Matt? Uh, well, uh, frankly, the first line has continued to struggle, and they were even broken up for a good portion of the second period. And, like, yeah, we this- saw, what was it, Goudreau, Monaghan, and Kachuk on the first line. Yeah, and those guys just need to get going. And, like, frankly, Arizona is terrible. And, you know, Calvin Pickard has, like, a nearly four goal against average. So you're going to win this game. When I heard Calvin Pickard was starting, I'm like, wow, I didn't know he was still around. Yeah, it's so, like, you already know that from the opening puck drop that you're going to win this game. It's just by how many. And,. Again, they haven't had any scoring from the top line, I don't think, but uh, the depth has come through again. So, yeah, it's a a bit concerning that the first line is struggling as bad as they are, but it's also a relief that the depth guys are picking up the slack. An interesting note for tonight, TJ Brody not playing in this game, and as such, Rasmus Anderson has been promoted to the first D pairing with the captain. If you're Raz, you got to be quite excited. I mean, he didn't make this team out of camp. He, you know, there's been some questions about him the last couple of years in his fitness, and here he is now playing on the top line. Yeah, uh, well, I, I guess if you're wanting a job, that's not a bad he, one. He to did have. get recalled, didn't he? he? Didn't make this team out of camp. Yeah, no, he didn't. That's what I thought. S- yeah, because Stone was the third. That's right, and guy. Valimaki made it. Yeah, and then Stone got hurt, and then he got recalled after that. But no, Anderson it's been a long has. Season. Yeah, Anderson's been quite good. It, you know, he's been up and down. He's also you know like 21 so i don't really blame him for that uh but he's looked very good in this game dalton prout 
I have to give him yet another. You gave him kudos compliment. last week as well. Yep, and he's had an excellent game in this one as well. Ha- can't complain. Uh, he's done everything a seventh defenseman should do, and you know, keep it up. But um, no, the team on the whole, like if you subtract the first line, I've liked how the second line's played. I've liked how the third line's played. I've liked how the fourth line's played. It's just the first line has been pretty much crap all game and as they have been since the all-star break and they need to get their mojo back and get going but you know frankly like for the next little bit the flames aren't in a huge amount of trouble if they're with the schedule upcoming like they only play the islanders twice and that's it for the good teams for the rest of the month well i was about to say you know this is a good time for the second line to be slumping especially as we're seeing other guys sort of picking up that slack because this is a time when i think we can afford to sort of work through that yeah and as long as those guys start to pick it up before the end of the month that that's the important thing and you know those guys are gonna struggle all the time you know like you're never gonna have guys that are just consistently hot nobody plays hot for 82 games no but as long as they can regain the magic before the playoffs that's the important thing and it's good to have the depth guys earning more responsibility and actually getting opportunities to score and like we've seen zarnik get another goal tonight uh Giordano got one on a beautiful assist from Kachuk. Derek Ryan's got eight points in eight games now, I believe. Yeah, so like we're getting for leak scored, like we're getting good scoring from all four lines. It's just we have to see if the that can both continue when the top line gets going and can the top line get going. And in a seven-game playoff series, I mean, your opponent is probably going to find the answer for our top line eventually. Oh, and for sure. So we need to have those two, three, four lines who can do some of that scoring when our guys can't be effective. Well, that's the thing. Like, if you look at teams that generally do well in the playoffs, it's not the team with, like, the best superstar. Like, it's usually the team that has four good lines. It's the most complete and, roster. Yeah. And, it, you know, a goalie can win a series by himself, like we saw with Yaroslav Halak, like, ten years ago. It, and... You know, that can happen, but for teams that are going into the second, third, and fourth rounds, it's usually the teams that are deep throughout their lineup. And like Vegas last year, they were they didn't have necessarily the best players, but they were a very deep team, and that's why they got to where they were. And Well, I mean, you could it, even argue in 2004, the Flames made to the Cup because of their goalie. Yeah. I, I think that may be the last time that a team got to the finals just based off of the goalie. but I think a lot of Vegas' success last year was... I wouldn't say it's all, but I think a lot of Vegas' success was because of their goalie last year. Uh, I wouldn't agree with you there. I think a lot... They had a lot of depth. Like, none of their guys were particularly awesome, like, other than William Carlson and Marcia So, But they just had a lot of good NHL players, and... Not necessarily, you know, guys that'll blow you away, but just high end depth, and that's sort of like what Calgary has now. And you're seeing a similar story where the Flames are doing really well, and it's because of that depth. And you know, so like I wasn't entirely surprised by Vegas last year, but it's you know, like any team can like if you're in a playoff series, like every team has a good first line. Yep because you're in the playoffs like you're not in the playoffs if you have only one guy well and if you look at the flames i mean that 3m line is probably going to be used to neutralize whoever we play against first line most nights yeah exactly so that'll neutralize their first line and they'll have a line like that probably their third or fourth they'll put it against our first line just to grind them down hit them be physical so you do need scoring from line two line three line four we're not going to get anywhere like you said, it's two or three guys can easily be shut down. You need a whole team effort. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's why, like, I don't, uh, like, with James Neal struggling all year, I haven't really minded too much just because of the fact that when the playoffs happen, like, he uh, is just as good as anybody to be one of those guys who is clutch during the playoffs and scores those important goals as a depth player. And, 
you know, the regular season, like, especially with the team doing so well, like, the regular season doesn't really matter in terms of his stats on themselves. So, you know, you just need more high-end depth and, you know, like, even it, referencing the 4 Cup run, like, we had a lot of guys that scored goals that were very important that were not players that you'd think of. Like guys like Ville Neiman and uh, Christoph Oliwa scored, I think, twice in the playoffs. Uh, Montador scored that one overtime goal. So, you know, like, you... Even then, we were getting a lot of depth scoring. It wasn't just the Ginla well, and Jelena. But I mean, doing those everything. depth guys were high up on the lineup. We were a team assembled of of uh, spare parts at that point. True. So th I think the biggest turnaround for me this week, if we talk about the story of the week, to me it's Mike Smith, and he's starting to look like an NHL goalie again. It's taken him a while to work through whatever it is he had to work through. I think part of it was probably physical. I don't think he was probably 100% ready to go from his injury last year. Part of it mental, but he's won. Um, he won the Florida game. He won the – or sorry, he lost the Florida game. He won the Pittsburgh game. It looks like he's going to win tonight. Um what do you think of Smitty and what we're seeing from him now? He looks like the goalie that he was at the beginning of last season who made the all-star team. And he's been dynamite. And I have, you know, if this is how he plays, honestly, I'm perfectly fine with him being the starter the rest of the way. Yeah. And, and, that and that's really the caveat. Well. You know, and that's the caveat if he continues to play like this. You know, and he earlier in the season had that one stretch of games at the end of November, early December, where he looked very much like this, and then it went away. And if he can not have it go away, then, you know, that bodes well, because he's very well rested. I think he's only played like 28 games or something like that this year. So, you know, you don't have to worry about him being tired going into the postseason. If you're the Flames, how long would you... Uh, he's played 29 games, started 27 of them, won 15, and lost 11 so far. Um, if you're the Flames, how long would you run Mike Smith right now to keep him going? Do you run him until the back uh, of the I, o I honestly let him go until the trade deadline and see what the hell you have. Because you know Riddick is reasonably solid, and... You know, he is not gonna he's not the best goalie in the world, but he's decent. So you already know what you have in him. This is do we need on deadline day to get a goalie? And this is where it's important to see and just give him every game from here on until the deadline, just to see. Because if he starts to slow down and be bad again, we need a goalie. If you don't and he doesn't and he looks good then you can start rotating Riddick back in and, like, whenever he loses the day after, the days after the trade deadline, and throw Riddick back in. But so there's you have four to games between now and the deadline today, which is uh, the Coyotes, and then there's the Islanders the, and Anaheim at home, and Ottawa on the road. You'd play them in all three? Yeah, let him rip and just see uh, what he's doing at the end of those three games. If he looks as solid as he has in all six of the games, then don't worry about getting a goalie at all. And the, he just got another win tonight. The Calgary Flames just won 5-2 to two over the Arizona Coyotes, I guess, this afternoon. Um, yeah. So the start of another win streak. We got two wins. Well, and for as bad as things are, it, like if you count the two overtime losses that the Flames have had as one win, the Flames are technically 4-4 four and four in the eight games since the All-Star break. So, not too, too bad. You know, like, it's not great by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, eight points in eight games, you know, it's not ideal but for where we are, but that's not yeah. anything to shake a stick at either. So. I'd rather be here than where we were, you know, last year trying to squeak out a couple points at this point. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's been a number of years Calgary's come into February looking for anything, just trying to get points to get into a wild card spot. Yeah, exactly. And we can struggle, and, you know, it, that that's fine. You know, like, okay, gee, we didn't get two points, big deal. You know, like, it, and it's good. And, like, frankly, like the rest of the way, 
like there's only like six games that are against high-end opponents like I, we play two against vegas two against the islanders one against toronto and one against the sharks and that's another reason i think you can keep mike smith going for a while is you know we've uh, we've got toronto coming up that's a high-end opponent i'd say yeah but, you know there yeah. there is a chance here to get mike smith going against some a lot of Eastern Conference teams, but also a lot of teams that we should be able to beat. And that might be the best way to get his, conf his confidence up. Yeah. And I have to give uh, Sigalette a lot of credit for working with Smith and Riddick. Because uh, each time that the guys have had plenty of time off to work on things, they have looked a lot better when they've come back into the net. And like Smith has, hasn't played much at all lately until the last three games but he's looked excellent and those adjustments do help when you have a decent goalie coach and uh, you know a lot of fans complain about Siglet, but you know he's doing a very good job i agree with you about mike smith i think he's back to his form that we need him to be at i think he probably he probably wasn't happy with himself knowing him, and I think this is where he wants to be. I would run him in the other three games this week to the deadline. I'd even give him the New York Islanders game after, which is the first of a back-to-back, -back, put Riddick in in uh, the New Jersey game, and then evaluate from there what you want to do going into March, coming back home. Uh, we do have a set of one set of back-to-backs in March, but I think you're probably going to see, I think if both guys are looking good, I think you'll see Smitty run more of the schedule in March just because he's the veteran guy and we know he can do that kind of schedule. Yeah, and plus you're, with Smith, if he's actually back, you want to kind of have him in the rhythm because if he's playing as he has for a good portion of his career, you want him starting in the playoffs. And it's one of those things he's been missing all year. And, like, that's been a lot of the complaints that we've had about him is that, like, this isn't the same Mike Smith. But if you have that guy, like, you want him to be the starter. It's just that, you know, then you have a very high-end backup in Riddick, and it helps. And, you know, you can't complain if you have two good goalies. I know this is going to sound bad, but the first thing that came through my mind today when Calgary beat Arizona is... Oh, Mike Smith won again. Well, that means we're not going to have to pay Riddick as much next year. <laughs> like, really, I think the fact that, you know, Riddick was looking like Superman for the first little bit and now he's gone on a bit of a slump, it shows he's a human and he's probably more of a backup guy and hopefully it'll change maybe his ask. Yeah, well, honestly, I, I didn't really expect him to get more than like a million and a half, two billion anyway, just because we're not the Edmonton Oilers and, oh, you've played 19 games. Here's like 11 no, million dollars no but at the same time i can see the agent <laughs> using koskin and as a as a comparable yeah and everybody that's the general managers are going yeah but it's edmonton and there's call stupid. edmonton see if they'll pay you that much if not come yeah. back with a reasonable number yeah exactly just because they're really stupid doesn't mean that we are too <laughs> would the xbox have signed a better deal i think anybody would have signed a better deal like you know honestly that was such a bad contract i'm just gonna take a minute here that was such a bad contract because they're already tight against the cap. Why not just wait until the off season? There are always a ton of options of goalies, and like even look at this year. Like you had Cam Ward and a handful of other guys that, and Mason and a whole bunch of guys that are proven that they're NHL caliber goalies. There's always a few. Like, you can spend your money more wisely than a guy who's played 19 games and then ever since he signed the contract has looked terrible. <laughs> you know, like, that's... Well, and, just... and if you like Koskinen, great, but wait till either closer to July 1st or after July 1st to get a comparable. Say, look, here's what guys of your comparable skill and time in the league are signing for, so we'll sign you for the same. No, oh, I know. Like honestly like he shouldn't have been more than a million and a half two million dollars and you know like three and a half you know that's just yeah really really dumb <laughs> well we talked about that contract and we're going to be talking more about contracts in the next week we're now one week away from the trade deadline um one of the most exciting times for the team and I guess all hockey fans, especially when you're the Flames this year and you're in a good position, it makes a lot more interesting. There's been years that we've said, oh, this team's going to have to sell. 
I, I think this is probably coming into this, even if we know they're going to be buyers, we don't know to what extent. And I don't know about you, Matt. I think this is the most uncertainty we've had coming to the deadline in a long time. Well, frankly, like part of the thing is, is that this year the Flames don't really need anything. Like there's a number of things that we'd like to have, but like if after the deadline we don't get anything, that's fine. You know, it, so like it's not the end of the world if the Flames decide that the prices are too high, which I'm expecting that they would be because you know at least right now, any team's gonna be that selling's gonna want full value for their players. But you know, like I, you know, like the stone rumors and all that. Like I don't see that being reasonable or realistic frankly uh because of the fact that like we don't need an all-star and stone is an amazing player and but we you know like if you got him like you're not gonna complain but do we need to go spend a first plus a good player plus another two good prospects to get him and and especially when you're not gonna keep him like it because he's probably going to get eight, nine million dollars. Like it, it just. Well, we don't need that. Trilliving has already come out and said to the media he won't move his first for a rental. So I don't think you're getting Stone without putting that first in there. And I don't think Stone is anything more than a rental for this team. Yeah, it, you'd love to have him, but is that going to make you a Stanley Cup champion in and of itself? No. Well, and this is the discussion I've been having with other fans this week is, you know what, just because we don't get a guy at the deadline doesn't mean we can't have them. A lot of these guys will get rented by somebody else and they'll be available July 1st. So we really have to ask ourselves, not so much what do we want to have, but what's going to make us better for the playoffs. And even if you remember last year, the Flames only made one trade. They traded a seventh rounder for Nick Shore. I could see him doing something very minor like that again. Oh, I agree. And that I'm expecting at least one or two of those type of deals to get a depth guy. Actually, oddly enough, uh, one of the players that I wouldn't mind off of Arizona is Brad Richardson, just for that very reason, a decent depth guy who's just a solid two-way guy. But, um, you know, we, like there's the, guys like that. We've spent the last couple of weeks talking about who's coming in. And I think we've probably done enough of that. Um, unless there's, you know, some big speculation you want to talk about, but I wanted to give you a quote from true living here and then talk a little about maybe what we think the flames are most likely to give up. Uh, Brad true living did an, uh, an interview this week with NHL.com and he quoted quote, I'm a firm believer. You build your team in the summer wholesale changes and major operational changes during the season for a whole bunch of reasons. It's more difficult to do. Um, and, and that's from Brad Trill living to NHL.com. So to me, that tells me he's not planning to go out and make any big deals at the deadline. As you always say, if a good deal comes around, if the price is right, yeah, you do it. But I think this is a year where there's a lot of higher end talent that I think is going to be really expensive. And, um, I just, I don't, I think what was a couple of years ago when the Flames tried to trade Camilleri and they couldn't get the deal done because there was a whole bunch of teams waiting for other talent to go first. I think this will be a year like that. Yeah, and frankly, I don't even think that the Senators are going to move Stone and Duchesne and Dzingel. I don't think they get all three done, but I think that'll put a wrench into everything. But, you know, uh, it, it's all about relative value and, like, what Treleving was saying about building in the off season, well, that's when prices are cheapest mm -hmm. to acquire talent, and whether it's at the draft or on July first, because teams aren't building for the future; they're trying to put their team together for the next year, and you can get free assets on July first. So, and especially this year, we can't build until we know how much money we got to spend on Chucky. Yeah, to me, and you can't you can't do anything without that number. Yeah, and it's one of those situations where, like, the Flames, uh, like, you can acquire guys at the deadline, and that's fine. It's just, it has to make sense, and most of the time, it really, really doesn't. And, you know, like, there are times, like, if you can get somebody that's in the 26 to 29-year age range for a guy and you can actually re-sign him for a reasonable amount, 
Like, that's part of the reason why, before I was mentioning Gustav Nyquist, because he fits that age range, and he'd be about $5 million to re-sign. Like, that's where you have to... You're gonna... Like, if you're gonna get somebody, it has to be in that middle six-ish range in terms of talent. But again, a, do we need Nyquist for a playoff run, or could we take a run at him in the summer? And that's the thing. Like, it, the Flames are gonna be awesome, frankly, for the rest of the year. And because they're such a young team, they can basically sell free agents of, hey, we're Chicago of right now, you know, and we're going to be a f cup contender for the next four or five years. You want to play for a team that actually has a good chance to win? Come. If you don't, you want to go play for some losers, there's some team up north that has plenty of money, <laughs> you know, and they have to you know they can go and sign anybody that they really want to on july 1st because winning you know entices players to actually want to come and play for you and you know like that's why like even free agent prospects like from the ncaa and that calgary would be a very good place to come just because of the fact that our prospect pool isn't particularly deep and the Flames eventually are going to need to replace guys with cheaper options, and those young players are going to want to play for a team that's actually good. So, you know, but uh, and as Calgary much as... can do it. Sorry, Calgary can do it now. It, like they can, if the price is right, and you're wanting the guy for the all, the long term, then why not do it now? But. If it's going to be too expensive now, I'd wait. I just don't think at this deadline the price is for anything worth... I mean, any player worth having that's going to affect your playoff run in any measurable way is going to be right. I no, think it's going to be it, a year, as it always is, but I think especially this year, it's going to be a year of overpayment for the few top guys available. Yeah, and like if the Flames could... like, I know a couple of years ago when the Oilers traded Hemsky, like if you can get somebody that's a depth scorer... It, like that has offensive talent for like a fourth or third or fourth round pick like that or like a guy like Thomas Vanek from Detroit you know and you're getting him for a third or a fourth fine you know you don't mind throwing that asset in well, the garbage last, last year the deadline Vanek got traded for Tyler Mott and UC Okanen last year the deadline Thomas Tatar got traded for a first second and third rounder yeah, well, Tatar is actually a better player than uh, you know. Like he was, he's young too. So like that's where. And I think the deal of the day last year was uh, Stasny being traded to Winnipeg for Foley a first and a conditional fourth. Like when I look at these, oh, and then the Kane deal as well. But you also got to look at how often does a does a rental actually change your team's fortunes? Like teams that are good going into this generally don't need to and i think the flames are in this boat don't need to add a whole lot that's why they're at the top of the standings the teams yeah. that are not great that are in a wild card spot are going out to buy but they can't buy enough generally to change their the course of what they're doing a lot so i w going into this i think the flames need to pretty much stand pat i mean of course as you always say if the de if the price is right sure but you know outside of a great deal i think the flames need to stand pat and rely on the roster they've got so far and maybe just get one or two depth pieces. Um, as we talked about last week, maybe some veteran guys, something that they're not looking at a long-term signing on. Yeah. And like, that's why like a guy like Vanek or something like that, uh, you know, just a depth player that who's has some offensive talent. Cause like if I'm kind of assuming that with the flames being quiet on James Neal, that he's probably going to be done for most of the rest of the season. I, it, they if they he was out for like a week or two i think they'd be saying oh it's just a short term thing no big deal but uh, you know with them being quiet i'm a little i think it's more of a serious ish thing and i think that the flames were going to like if especially if he's out until round 1 then i think the flames are going to need to get just a depth guy to kind of replace and it doesn't need to be a top end guy just a body to fill that role well let's back up a little bit we've talked this week and in the past about guys we see coming in what do you think are the most likely pieces that the flames give up at the deadline when we're sitting here next week talking about the trade deadline what do you think we see shipped out uh i frankly only think that uh you're more likely to see just draft picks go 
I Do you think the first is pretty much a given to go at this point? If they get a top six ish forward like if they go for like a Nyquist or a Zuccarello or Hayes or any of the name ish guys, then the first goes with goes with them, but um if just, it's just depth guys, then they have the third and fourth and all that. Do you, so. do you expect to see any roster player moved? And if you do, who do you think leaves? Uh, the only thing I could see is like if they're trying to move out Cap to, you know, like say including Stone in the deal just for Cap purposes. At that point, I'd almost rather move that at the draft. Oh, I know. Uh, but like that's pretty much like i don't really see the flames deleting from the roster like and i don't still in the ir so we get some cap relief because of that yeah like i don't see the flames uh ditching like any of their higher end young guys like i could see lazar maybe um i think for the if we're talking about bringing in a top six guy like you were saying earlier i could see a guy like dubay or manjipani having to go Eh, I could see that as well. I, I wouldn't like to see either one of them go because I I'm actually liking the pair of them. Um, it, if you needed to, that would be you know. And there's a handful of other guys that are okay, but I don't think this time next year at the 2020 deadline, Frolik is still flame. But I think you got to hold on to him this year. Yeah, I agree. Especially with you're Neil gonna... being unknown. Well, yeah, well, the thing is, you're going to have to, like, if you trade for a league, you're going to have to go and get another for a league. Yeah. So, like, why bother? I think that 3M line could be very useful to us in the playoffs. Yeah, exactly. They know how to play with each other. They're, they've are they been awesome for a long time, so just let that be. Going down this roster, Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm not going anywhere. No. Kachuk, Backlund, for a league not going anywhere. Maybe for a league. Yeah, um, Pro Lake is the only one I could see going, and again, that would be only if Cap was needed in a trade. What about the line of Jankowski, Bennett, Zarnick? To me, Zarnick isn't. Everyone's got an Austin Zarnick. No one wants our Austin Zarnick. No, he's just, and he hasn't been particularly good. He only has four goals this year. So Bennett's looking good this year. Then the Flames want to hang on to him, and I yeah. can't see there being a lot of value in Jankowski at this point. He's looking good. I think they'll want to keep yeah. him, but for I mean, for where he's progressing to, you're not going to get enough to move him. That's kind of no. What I mean. Yeah, he's more value, and same with Bennett. They're more valuable as flames than they are as trade and, pieces. So, and then the last line of Manjapani, Ryan Hathaway. Nobody's going to want to take on the Ryan contract, and he's looking good as a flame. I think they want to keep him. Nobody. Oh, if if you wanted to trade Derek Ryan, I think there's probably 20 teams that would take him right now. It, because he is very good at what he does and but again he's ours and he's awesome so just let him be i everyone's got a garnet hathaway i don't think he moves but i could see no. magic penny moving yeah and i wouldn't like to see him go because he, he's starting to get his offensive game going and i think he could be a decent scorer down the road it's just you know need time just like dube and then looking on the back end, Gio and Brody aren't going anywhere. No. Hannafin and Hamannick aren't going anywhere. No. And I'd, frankly, the kids, I don't want to see any of them go. I could see Shillington moved again, sort of like uh, Dubé, in the right deal if they need to throw a young guy in. I think of the three kids, Shillington might be the one they're willing to part with. But I think it'd have to be for more yeah. than a rental. Yeah. It, uh, the only way I'd be comfortable with Shillington going is if you're getting a guy that you're going to keep for five years. And, you know, like, if you needed to, sure, fine. But you I mean, we don't not... have a lot of high-end prospects. To me, Shillington no. and Dubé are the two high-end prospects that I could see moving. Yeah, and frankly, I like, to be frank, I don't think that the Flames, it would be in their best interest to move any of their young, four young defensemen. I think you just let them be. And just let them do their thing and <coughs> keep them, period. Yeah, I mean, they they don't have a lot of trade chips. That's the only reason I bring up Shillington's name is I can see him being a tradable asset. Oh, I agree. And you know, you could trade any of them, but you know, you don't. It, well, it's I think just like with Bennett the fact and we saw Raz they're... on the top pairing tonight, and this team's very high on Valimaki. I don't think those guys go anywhere. So I think no. Shillington sort of. Yeah, and I think out. that I know, and I think that with all 
all of them that they're more valuable to us than what you'd get in return. So that's where, like, I'm kind of, I'd just rather not, like, I'd rather include, like, frankly, I'd rather include Dube or uh, Manjipani or, like, several of the forward prospects just because forwards are always easier to come by than defensemen and all four of them are d between Hannafin and the three kids there. But sometimes that's why teams ask for defensive prospects. Yeah, I know. And I'd rather just not do that trade then. <laughs> so. Well, and I think, you know, and I think the flames are in a position that they can do that. They don't have to add a piece to get out of a wild card spot. I think we would be perfectly happy saying, you know what doesn't match what we need. We're sitting pat. Yeah, and like frankly, like if it if I was in charge, like if anybody asked for any of those players, I'd be like, yeah, no, I'm good, thanks, and click and go on to the next guy. Yeah, I mean, there's as we talked about, there's a lot of names I like here, but I don't know we need them at the deadline. I think a lot of these guys could be July first acquisitions. Exactly, and you know, you always want to like stack the deck in your favor as much as possible, but. You know, it, cost matters. And if you can get guys that are useful and for a reasonable amount, awesome, great, do it. But, you know, it's everything's relative. And, you know, like if it costs like the Flames first and third to get a guy like Nyquist or equivalent guy, sure, awesome, go for it. But, you know, if you're starting to add Shillington or anything like that into the mix, it's like, yeah, I'm good. Uh, yeah, I personally, I don't see the need for the Flames to go and pay the cost for a top six rental. Yeah, it just depends on, like, if they can keep that guy. Like, frankly, like... But then it's not a rental, right? Yeah. Well, like, the thing is, is that, like, you, if you're looking at a 25th to 30th or 31st overall pick, which is where the Flames pick is going to likely end up... You're like you're looking at guys that are more like Dubé or Klimchuk or Poirier in terms of talent. Like there's the odd guy that's decent, but it's not. You're not guaranteed to get the decent guy. Usually, most of the players there bust or are just and, filler guys. And at the so, same time, if you really like a guy in that round, I think we have enough assets. Even if you look at a Froelich or a Stone, that we could trade back into the twenty fifth to thirtieth pick. I I don't think you get that with those type of guys. Well, not but, just those guys, but I think you could put together a package including those guys to trade your way back in if you needed to. Yeah, but frankly, at that point, I think you'd just be fine to sell those guys for whatever round picks that you're getting, like a third or a fourth, and just you know try to you know like what they did last year with getting some higher end pro young guys who have problems that are fixable and you know we'll see i i'm so matt we've talked about depth and that being something maybe for the flames to look at is bringing in depth guys um does the ch does the fact that dalton proud actually looks like an NHLer change your thoughts on needing to bring in a depth defenseman i uh, actually i'm if they can get somebody and it costs like the equivalent of a seventh round pick then sure um, just because, like, frankly, I'd like to have nine defensemen that can play at the NHL level, and right now, we have eight, if you include Prout. So, you know, it, like, once you get past Prout, you're into guys like Renat Valiev, who, if worse came to worse, like, I wouldn't really want to see him out there Matt in a playoff game. Termina? Yeah, like, those guys, a you know, like, you could, but, you know, like, they're guys that are going to be playing, like, five minutes, and, like, the other five defensemen are going to be burnt. Because to me, I agree, if we can get them for a seventh, great, but if not, I think that Prout's elevation and the fact that we'll see you so recalled before the playoffs, I think it lessens the need for the Flames to sort of have that on their must-do list. Yeah. Like, if it costs a guy like Spencer Fu or something like that, or, like, one of the veteran forward guys for, like, the equivalent guy on defense. It's like, okay, like sure. You're talking about, like, Quine or Buddy Robinson or those kind of guys? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, if it costs one of those for the equivalent of a defenseman, then sure, awesome. But, like, I wouldn't be going and spending, like, a fifth or something, you know, because Proud's done well. 
honestly, he kind of reminds me a bit of Derek England, frankly, with his play, where it's just solid. And, yeah, I wouldn't go that far, like, to rely on him. But he's, he's more valuable playing... than Eddie Lack, who we gave up for him. Definitely. And he's looking decent, and that's all you need, is just somebody who is not a complete tire fire in their own zone. And he's doing all right, and that's what you need from his type of guy. Like, you're not, like, with an eighth defenseman, which, frankly, he is, you're not expecting him to be awesome. You, he just needs to do his job, and he is. And so, awesome. And going great. to the playoffs, honestly, the eighth defenseman will probably play five minutes every four or five games, if that. Yeah, if that. And that's why, like, in a longer playoff run, you need to have... I feel like nine players that can play at an NHL level just in case you run into a whole string of injuries. Because we all remember Brendan Evans back in 04 who we had to recall on an emergency basis. But even then, a guy like else. Renad Valiev, I think, you know, playing five minutes every fourth game, I'd be okay with that. Yeah. I, I, I'd like somebody better. But if it worse came to worse, that's okay. But, yeah, it, it just depends on the cost. If it's basically zero, then awesome, go for it. But if not, it's not that important. You've also mentioned on this show quite a bit of how you think the Flames did just get any serviceable NHL goalie when Mike Smith wasn't looking good. If Smith continues playing like we've seen him play for the last three games, do you think the Flames take that need for a goaltender off the table? Yeah, it, it, that's why I'd like to see him play the next three games, run him right to the deadline. If he looks as good as he has in the last three games in the next three, then don't. there's no need. If he starts to let in weak goals again and looks like the Smith that we've seen all season, then you need to pull the trigger and get somebody. It doesn't need to be a high-end guy, just a warm body. And do you think that if James Neal is out until after the deadline, and you mentioned it earlier that the Flames are kind of being cagey with his return day right now, but if he's going to be gone for much longer than the deadline, do you think that might force the Flames' hand to go out and try and get a better forward? Well, it's one of those things. If they can get a decent guy, middle six guy anyway, then they should just go do that regardless. But, but do you think they might be willing I, to pay a little bit more now with James James Neal out? I think that... like I, regard, I hate to say it, it, I haven't missed him a lot since he's been out. No, and frankly, like if they can get a veteran guy who has offensive talent, like, and it doesn't need to be... Like, if you can get like the current equivalent of Versteeg, you know, just somebody who knows what they're doing offensively, but it's just there... You know, that would be perfectly fine. Like, it's, Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a middle six guy, though. That's really a bottom six. Yeah, you know what I mean. At that like, point, would, somebody, that guy be, that, would that guy be better than, say, Curtis Lazar? Yeah, I think so. You think so? Because, uh, I mean, and you, it, it, all, it always again, depends it on the de asset, but I don't want to yeah. give much up to get that rental middle no, six and guy. It, yeah, it also depends on what the cost is. And, you know, like, frankly, like, if it's more than a third-round pick or equivalent, then no. I'm okay, well good. let's let's put it this way. Maybe the Flames are trying to get a guy like Vanek or somebody who'd be very cheap before. Do you think now that Neil's out, they might say we have to go after a uh, you know a Wayne Simmons or somebody like that in order to fill that spot? They could, but the price would have to be right. And uh, like. I mean, you it's can always, one of those you things. Can make it's a deal not work urgent. if you need it, but I guess yeah, what I'm trying to say, Matt, is do you think that they now up their game of we have to give whatever it's going to take to get X to fill no, that Neil spot? I, I don't think so. I think that, like, frankly, I expect them to get a middle six forward regardless, whether that's a more upper end guy like a Zuccarello or a Nyquist or whatever, or if it's a mid to lower end guy like a Manic. There's going to be somebody, I feel, just one more decent offensive player. Whether the Neil's better or not, like, it doesn't really matter. You think they'll go with the same strategy either way? Yeah. It, like, yeah, it, I agree. It, uh, you know, because, like, Neil, he's fine. Like, if he's back in the lineup and is playing well, great, awesome. Mm -hmm. If you can get that other guy, like, it, 
it's basically just trying to upgrade for a leak. Spot. Right, which is what we've talked about. So, so to answer yeah. the question, then no, they don't probably change their strategy based on Neil by himself. They'll probably no. add a forward, but Neil's injury doesn't change that need. No, because you're basically what the goal is is to upgrade for a leak at his offensive spot and on the second line. And if you can get that veteran guy who can score or a more longer term piece that can score and throw him on the 3M line in for a league spot, that's great. And if like say Neil's out for the rest of the year in the playoff part of the playoffs, then you just throw that guy in on the third line with Bennett and Jankowski instead of disrupting the 3M line. If Neil's back, then you can you know, move for a leak down to Manjapani's spot or and put the offensive guy up there or you know, you can shift things around or put the offensive guy on options. the fourth line. You know, like there's definitely different ways you can go about it. But I just feel that they're gonna go and get one more body. To me, it's outs just outside of the depth pieces like the seventh round pick, the sixth round pick, the crappy prospects, to me the flames have enough assets to make one good trade. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, if we say goaltending is good enough, defense is probably good enough, they've got enough assets to make one top six piece at the deadline, and that's it. I mean, yeah, they might, like you said, trade a seventh for a veteran or something like that, but in terms of a good move, they got one in them, and they have to figure out what that one is. Yeah, and I think that's why they're going to be asking all the d different teams to see who's available and what the cost is, and... Like, I'm sure that they have a list and are going to be keep hammering Make the phones. Make a list, to, checking it twice. Yep, and see what it's going to cost. And, you know, if the price is right, then come on down. But if it's not, then, you know, like, if we come to the day after the deadline and the Flames have made no trades, okay, sure. I don't see them making nothing. I think they're going to do something. I think it could be, like I said, a Nick Shore like last year, seventh round for a Nick Shore. But I would be surprised if we are talking on the 25th after the deadline and they've done nothing. Oh, so would I. But, you know, if it, that's how it worked out, I'd be fine with that too. It's It'd be kind of a boring show to talk about. You know, oh, it was a really exciting deadline. We did nothing, but... You know, um, and sometimes it, the best thing you can do is do nothing. Like this team is working. This team's at the top. We don't need to change it a lot. It's fun as fans to think about making trades, but you can also really screw up the chemistry of your team by making a, a move or two. So maybe the best thing to do is hold Pat. Well, look at the Winnipeg Jets. Like uh, Shevel Dayoff got a lot of flack from Jets fans for a number of years for not making trades. And, like, he would repeatedly, like, every year, year in, year out, he wouldn't make many, if any, trade. And it, he was doing things patiently and letting things build from within. And now the Jets are one of the top teams in the league. And that's due to his patience. So, like, if the Flames, if their deal isn't correct, then don't make the deal. Uh, like, there's no pressure. You know, like, the Flames are a young team, regardless. And... All of their key players are under long-term contracts for cheap. So they can go on July 1st and say, hey, we're awesome. Come join us. And there's they'll no, get somebody. There's no evident hole that we have to trade all our assets to fill for a long run. This team's been number no. one. It tells us that this roster is a good roster. If we can make a reasonable update, a reasonable cost, great. But otherwise, do your shopping July 1st. Exactly. If the price is right, awesome. Otherwise, who cares? Well, on that, we got uh, an email from Ryan Swanson, a fan of the show um, who's we've read a lot of his tweets in the past. He was talking to us about the trade deadline and some of our thoughts last year, last week when we talked about the need for a veteran, a depth veteran guy. And he has some bullet point thoughts here I'll read, and then we can give our thoughts on them. Uh, he says, we already have veterans with playoff experience. Neil Hamannick Smith, don't think we need to get a veteran forward or defenseman. The NHL is all about following trends for those that have been successful uh, with going against the status quo. The flame should be a trend setter instead of a trend follower. Keep the forwards in defense and continue to instill trust. E EX, uh, the young defensive core. Don't go out and waste your first rounder. Keep it for when it will have more value at the draft. And our team record shows that we have a good club with the new coaching staff. They're doing something right. 
if they're in, in, injuries instead of relying on say that like you were saying the veteran defenseman or veteran forward he says utilize the energy of the youth long term it may go further to the players trusting them in the playoffs and eventually for the team in future playoff appearances so any thoughts on ryan's bullet points there i can see where he's coming from but it's one of those like typically like if the flames first line didn't have johnny gaudreau i'd be fine with not getting a veteran guy it's just that our main offensive driver is a very small player. And in the playoffs, you need some people that have been there to that know how to get around that and how to work through that. And But as he says, we it's not like we have none of them. We have Neil uh, Hamlin, I know. Smith. I know. And... We do have a couple of Even guys. Even Froelich has been in the playoffs, I believe. Yeah, he's won the cup with Chicago. Yeah. So, you know, like we have four guys that have been to the playoffs on more than one occasion. It's just that... And the fact the, that Stockton's not doing well, I can see a whole bunch of call-ups happening, and it would give you a whole range of players if you do need somebody to slot in on a 3-4. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and even guys like, yeah. I mean, you know, Quine has looked good this year. And I think, you know, on the bottom six, yeah, maybe, you know, he's good enough to play a couple games. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's just, it's more about knowing how to deal with certain situations that arise in playoff series and how to get to those set next levels. And the Flames are so young and inexperienced that they don't know how to follow that formula and they could screw their season by just not knowing how it is to get to that next level. And if you have some people that have been there, then they can, you know, shortcut things. And I it's think it's one of those things. Like I think if you bring in ice, a guy who's got playoff experience and I know where Ryan's coming from with the youth and the energy, it doesn't mean you have to go to them. It could just be to have some of that experience, as Matt said last week, in the room. Um, yeah, like you know, it's you're not you needing bring, the guy to be awesome on the ice. And you it, could bring in a guy like Vanek, never play him, and give the spot instead to a Dubé or a Fu. Yeah, or even Kunitz. Like, I'd be perfectly fine having Kunitz on the team. I wouldn't want to see him on the ice. But just having them there is enough. And well, and even going down the stretch as we end the season, I mean, we're probably going to be resting top guys as we move, you know, into those last weeks of March and April. And maybe then you put Kunitz in for one game. Yeah. Like, you, you, you know, can throw him in. Role. Yeah, exactly. You can throw him in, like, anytime you need some physicality because he is a bit of a <laughs> not so nice player at times. But, you know, it it like in his case like he'd basically be a coach that would be just instructing okay this is what's going on this is what you need to do and you know he's won the cup four times so he kind of knows yeah so there's you know. so you know well we'll wrap this one up by just saying that we understand where ryan's coming from matt's really on the veteran camp i'm a little bit in the middle the Flames could do it either way, and it would probably be okay. Like, that veteran's not going to bring enough where we're saying we must go yeah. out and acquire, you know, at any cost, veteran players. I think what Matt's trying to say is if we can give up almost nothing, like a seventh rounder, it can't hurt to have that guy around. Exactly. And, like, you're not expecting that guy to come in and be awesome and be, like, the savior of the team offensively. He's there for his off-ice contributions more than it's on ice and if he can fill in and be decent the hey awesome but that's not what the main purpose is of getting him whichever guy it is and then we got another email this week from someone who has called himself anxious in acme so i guess a fan from small town alberta um, not the company that makes the anvil for uh, the roadrunner and it says, I'm worried about our Flames. They lost a winnable game to the Florida Flounders, and don't try consoling me with that loser point thing. The zip has gone out of this group, no question. I think we should shake things up before our playoff chances completely evaporate. Let's bring back Brian Burke and trade some of these wussy boys for someone with more truculence like Dion Phaneuf. Respectfully, Anxious and Acme. Uh, I think we found our next Oilers GM right here. 
Yep, he's the leading candidate. Um, yeah, that. Yeah. This is this is what I heard all week. Like the flames lost a couple, and the sky was falling in the sea of red. Yeah. And you know, every team, as I've said in the past, every team's gonna have a losing streak. We had ours. We played yeah. through it. You know, I think people were getting in a microcosm. Yeah, it wasn't a great game, but if you look at season wide, it's no big deal. Yeah. Oh yeah, and like even last week, like I was saying, like we're on yellow alert type of thing, and you know because it was how they were losing was disconcerting, and they still haven't really like even though they won the last two games, like they still haven't played well, like themselves. But you know what? If you're gonna go deep in the playoffs, you have to find a way to just win. It doesn't really matter how you win or who's getting you that win. You've got to find that way to win. And I think that to me is what I've seen the last couple games is the flames are just, you know, the death guys are finding the way. Like, you know, when you're going deep, you're not always going to have those top three and they're going to get banged up and not playing as well. And you need your Ryans, your Mangiapanis, your Bennett's, your Jankowski's to be the ones to save the day sometimes. For sure. And, you know, it, it that has been a good thing of late. It's just that, you know... It, there is some concern still, but you know, like they're like Smith, he's working through things and those guys aren't going to be held back for long. Like Lindholm had a chance today where like before the all-star break, it's an easy goal, but instead of lifting it up over the goalies, Patty shot it into it. And you know, just small things like that. Like he got a perfectly good chance. It just, it didn't go in for him. Yep. And Show like, me a once... player who's played a good 82 games, like every game of an 82 game season. Well, pretty much have to go with 99 and 66. <laughs> yeah, and that's why those guys are who they are, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's it's going to come and go. Yeah, and it's nothing to be overly concerned about. It's just that, like, especially with the team winning a few games, it's like okay, good. Now get everything back you know get the wheels going and let's power through the next while because frankly they play a lot of mediocre teams over the next stretch so you know and they just have to get everything in working order once the playoffs hit so you know there's gonna struggle this is the time you want to do it not on april 1st the last piece of news for the week before we get to our predictions is the Penticton Rookie Tournament the Flames have taken place in for, oh geez, it's got to be, what, 10 years now? Something like that. Uh, it's been canceled for the coming season. Calgary didn't participate last year because of the China trip, and the Vancouver Canucks who organized it have canceled it. So I think probably for the better, Calgary doesn't have a rich prospect pool. Edmonton hasn't had a great prospect pool. I like the idea of a rookie tournament, but I don't like it always being in Penticton. I would love to see four teams like Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, and Seattle and move it around. Maybe have it in Red Deer one year and Lethbridge one year. Sort of find like a WHL city near each of those teams. Um, You know, you've got what Spokane and the WHL and maybe play it there. Yeah. Makes sense to me. You know, Lethbridge, but... uh, Medicine Hat. We got dub teams all over BC. I know. It, it's a little disappointing, especially because it gives us something to do, uh, you know, in preparation for the season. But, you know. Well, I like the idea I of can rookie understand- on rookie. Yeah, and I can understand why, like, teams are probably a little less interested. But, you know, it. It sucks, frankly, because, you know, like, I know that uh, there's probably been a number of injuries that have happened just due to those tournaments, and you'd like to have those guys be fresh for your actual training camps and all that, but... But even then, I think, I don't think that they're going to go without those games. I think all the organizations find the benefit in doing them, and, I mean, in the past, we've seen, say, the Flames rookies play the University of Calgary Dinos. I'd yeah. rather see them play another NHL team than the dinos i mean no offense to the dinos but it's generally not great competition there so yeah. i think if you're gonna play rookies you might as well play them against other nhl teams i agree and who knows they might sort something out between now and then but you know like i know the flames and oilers this past year did their own little rookie thing well, and they've I think always they done might... the split squad thing as well so we'll see 
Yeah, I think, like I said, I would wait a couple of years until Calgary builds up their prospects. Edmonton does. Seattle's going to need a couple of years. But I could see those four teams, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, Seattle, doing something just because of the quick proximity. I mean, you could be back in your bed from any of those stops that night if you wanted to. Yeah. Or figure out what's right in the middle and meet there. Uh, Penticton's cool, but it's, I know some people have said it was, it's a nice city, harder to get to for some Flames fans, a little more expensive city. So maybe that has something to do with it as well. Yeah. And, and I think too, not being a, an NHL rink, it was probably harder for some of the logistics. Yeah. And, uh, while we're talking about prospects, uh, back in July, uh, on one of our recap shows for that, uh, we were discussing uh, Mason McDonald, and uh, like a, he looked better this year at the development camp than he had in all of the previous ones, and he's starting to look like he's turning it around. In the last ten games, he's six three and one, and I think he has three shutouts in that span, and is looking quite good uh in kansas city so he you know he's looking like he's turning it around he's been solid for most of this season and it's good to see him reclaiming a little bit of the potential that he had and hopefully he can push forward we'll talk more about both teams after the deadline but i don't think mace never makes the nhl but i think you could see him as a ahl goalie next year you, with goalies, you just never know. And, like, even, like, Steve Mason, it took him a while to figure out his game. Like, I know Columbus rushed him to the NHL early, but... I just think, he, look, okay, let's say never a goalie in the NHL in Calgary, because I think if you look at our goalie depth, I think he's going to get buried. I, I wouldn't even go that... Good. I wouldn't even go that far. You know, it's... He, Look at David Riddick. You know, he kind of came out of nowhere and has been very good. So, Yeah, it's a lot different uh, when, you, w- when you're playing those men's leagues in Europe. Yeah. Well, with having four goalies that are all showing potential, it's just like with the four young defensemen that we have. You don't know who is go- of that foursome is going to be best. Obviously, it's likely going to be Ham- Hannafin, but you don't know of the other three guys who's going to be stellar. So, you know, you have to just wait and see. And I think with all four of those goalies, they're all playing reasonably well. Uh, The AHL guys a little less so, but that's the AHL team's also kind of garbage. So, you know, and it's a little, their numbers are deceiving because of the fact that their defense is horrible in Stockton. So, um, We'll, we'll see. We'll look more at the Stockton team after the deadline. I think that'll be a good uh, a good follow-up in March to take a look at. Yep. Well, Matt, with that, it's time for the predictions game. As always, we look ahead to the next week and predict what's going on. Uh, last week, you and I put in our predictions. Neither of us did well. I thought we would beat Florida and Pittsburgh, uh, lose to Tampa Bay and Arizona. You thought we'd lose everything but Arizona, so neither of us won. Um, it was two wins. Um, it just wasn't the two that we both expected. Yep. So this week, the Flames have three games. They're on a bit of a home swing. They played today at home against the Arizona Coyotes. They play Wednesday at home against the Islanders and Friday at home against the Anaheim Ducks. Then Mon- or sorry, then Sunday, they make a quick trip to Ottawa at, for a 5 p.m. start time to play the uh, Ottawa Senators, and then no game on Monday, which is trade deadline. So we have three games, the Islanders, the Ducks, and the Senators. What do you think happens in those three? I'm going to go win, win, win. You think three wins? Yeah, and the one that is questionable will be the uh, Islanders game. The Ducks are terrible, and the Senators are the worst team in the NHL. They have to win those games. So, just because those teams are horrible. So, yeah, uh, I'm going to go with three wins. The They need the four points from the two loser teams. I, I put down the same uh, earlier today when I did my predictions. I said they'll win all three. I think they might lose the second game next week to the Islanders in Nassau, but I think yeah. they'll beat the Islanders this week in the Dome. I agree. So if you want to see some Flames hockey, there's two home games there this week, Wednesday and Friday, and then uh, they're on the road again, but they'll be back quite a bit in March. So enjoy those couple games before they're back on the road. 
Yep. All right, Matt. Well, you have a good week. Enjoy. I guess the big thing is the trade deadline. And we'll talk to you next week right after the deadline on Monday evening. And uh, we will recap what the Flames do or don't do. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, like Every morning when I wake up, the first thing I do is check Calgary Puck to see if the Flames have done anything. So it'll be an interesting week to see who and what. Do you ever get like almost like spider sense for trades. Like I know there's been times I'm like, it feels like they're going to make a trade today and I'm constantly refreshing more than I usually would. Yeah, I do too. You know, or you see a, you see something happen like the James Neal thing or the stone thing. It's like, Hmm, somebody's probably going to get a trade made this week, but yeah. All right. Well, Matt, you have a good week and we'll talk to you next Monday. Thanks for listening. Everybody have a good week. Enjoy the deadline. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.